Thank you, Clive. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Klaus, indeed, for um, the kind invitation uh, here. I, I knew Klaus in, in Washington, uh, so it seemed like a very natural thing when he invited me down to Chapel Hill uh, that I should do so, uh, and all the more so because I've just spent the last uh, three days in, um, at the convention uh, in Charlotte, and um, after three nights attending uh, a convention of this nature, it's a great source of comfort and relief uh, to have an opportunity uh, to come to Chapel Hill and talk a little bit about issues uh, to do with Ireland, uh, to do with Europe, to do with the relationship, or indeed to do with anything you want to discuss uh, later on. I'm not going to go on uh, too long. Uh, I will speak for about maybe 20 minutes and then we go to a Q&A. And as Klaus says, I'm absolutely happy uh, to uh, take questions on any subject. Um, can't guarantee that I'll be able to give an answer in every respect, but I'll certainly try. So the, the floor will genuinely be open, and um, I look forward to engaging with you. For us, it's extremely important to get out. I'd rather that I was not here discussing Ireland and the Euro crisis, but given the nature of what's been happening in Ireland and what's been happening in Europe, um, it's important that I should do so. Uh, if 10 years ago I came here, um, I can tell you there would be only one subject that I would be talking to you about, and that would be the subject of trying to establish uh, peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, it was a subject that uh, would have dominated our discourse. It certainly dominated our presence here in the United States as a representative of the Irish government or for the Irish government. Um, it was a major, major challenge uh, uh, to our country and it was a major crisis that had to be addressed. Uh, fortunately, we're in a situation today where we do have peace in Northern Ireland. We do have peace on the island of Ireland and we do have established and uh, the best uh, set of relations between Ireland and the United Kingdom in the history of the relationship between our two islands. So that's a good success story. And then when I came to the United States in 2007, uh, the first thing I would say is that I was proud to represent a country at peace, you know, which we are and which we uh, were then. And I was proud to represent a country that was prospering and developing like no other time in its history. Well, as I say, the first part of it's true. The second part, I've had to adjust the narrative a little bit <laughs> as we've gone along. Uh, but I would like to share some of those insights with you, and I appreciate I'm among an audience and, um, um, and um, faculty here who are pretty familiar with the subject to begin with. Um, I haven't got all the answers. I wish I could say to you that I'm going to share to you today some wonderful insights which provide the definitive solution uh, to whether it's Ireland's problems or Europe's problems. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm just happy to speak about them and I'm happy to have an opportunity to do so and to be in the company of my colleague, um, Paul Gleeson, who's our consul in Atlanta. And uh, despite the rather challenging situation in Ireland, one of the things we have been able to do uh, over the last few years is, believe it or not, to open a new office in the United States, a new consulate, as we have done in Atlanta. And what I tell you how unusual this is, um, you know, you need to bear in mind uh, that this is the first consulate uh, career consulate that Ireland has opened in the United States since Prohibition. So it's, um, <laughs> but finally we've discovered that there is a part of the United States that we need to pay a little bit more attention to, and that's this area here starting in North, in North Carolina, and in Paul's case all the way down to, um, uh, to Florida, and to begin to fly the Irish flag maybe in ways that we haven't done so before, because as all of you know, there's a rich connection between this part of the world, between this part of the United States, uh, and Ireland uh, over the generations, and indeed this was probably one of the initial inaugural areas uh, where the Irish in the 18th century, which was before the major wave of emigration, would have come to down the Shenandoah Valley, and obviously for many of them making their homes on the edges of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and you know this area would have been very, very familiar uh, to them. So it's uh, appropriate that after all of these years that I should finally come here uh, to acknowledge that fact, and uh, just to share in some of um, that, that wonderful experience that is the experience of the Irish in the United States. Because if the Irish are here in Chapel Hill or here in North Carolina, uh, from the generation perhaps that came here uh, in the 18th century, of course, in succeeding generations, uh, the Irish have found themselves into every corner and every part of the United States. And in every corner of the United States, there is Irish America. And that's something we're uh, enormously mindful of. Uh, at times in our past, this was a, you know, the, the question of immigration from Ireland was a source of difficulty for us. Uh, but in more recent years, it's also a source of pride, uh, pride in the accomplishments and the achievements of our diaspora 
of whom in the United States there are at last count at least 40 million. And I think on St. Patrick's Day, that figure approaches 100 million. So <laughs> in any event, um, I'm just very pleased and I'm going to speak a little bit about Ireland, the Ireland uh, uh, that, that I represent and very proud to represent, uh, 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 speak to you about um, uh, where we have come in Ireland, um, uh, the story of Ireland's uh, uh, tremendous achievements on the economic uh, field, the difficulties that we have uh, encountered and uh, continue to try and grapple with, how that all interfaces with, um, with our European, um, the, the European Union, of which we're a proud member, and uh, I mean, that goes without, uh, goes, goes without saying that we're, we're active and proud members of the European Union and have been since 1973, and also we're members of the Euro currency area with 16 other countries, so we share that cur currency in common. And we're deeply, just to make sure that it's fully appreciated, we're deeply committed uh, to this relationship with Europe. We're deeply committed to this relationship, uh, relationship with, our, with our Euro member, uh, fellow Euro member countries. And obviously we're deeply committed uh, to finding a way forward in Europe, uh, which assures uh, uh, Europe's continuing success. Ireland en enjoyed a, a sustained boom for a period of about uh, 15 years, from the mid-1990s almost until uh, 2008. And it was a source of tremendous international attention, the fact that Ireland you know, prospered like never else before in its history, or indeed um, among European member states was one of the fastest growing countries in, the Euro, in, in Europe or indeed in, in the world. Um, this growth that we experienced at times reached 7%, 8%, 9%, the type of growth rates that you today associate with China, and the type of growth rates we dearly love to have again. But they were the growth rates that we were experiencing uh, during that period of the boom, which started in the mid-1990s, after a very, very difficult 1980s. But we got our act together, and the 1990s, as the 1990s emerged towards 2000, uh, we began to enjoy tremendous success. And it's very important, I think, to appreciate the fact that this success, therefore, was not a flash in the pan. It was not just a one-year wonder or a two-year wonder. It was a sustained, um, it was a sustained period of growth for, which lasted for almost 15 years. And important to understand that the reasons why we were, we were, we grew so successfully in those years, um, you know, and the reasons why Ireland was a success, really are all still there today. The only problem is that we have had to manage, in the meantime, over more recent years, a crisis associated with with the, the banking crisis and with property, a property bubble which spectacularly exploded in 2008. So in that period of, the, of 2000, um, 1995 to really 2008, Ireland enjoyed tremendous growth. Uh, we enjoyed essentially coming towards the end of that period, we enjoyed full employment. And for those of you uh, who appreciate uh, you know, the statistics in this, full employment in our case was something around 4%. That, that, that represents full employment statistically in our case. This had never ever happened in our history before. Ireland had always been a country which could never uh, you know, look after the totality of its people at home, so therefore people emigrated, as they did in, over the generations, as, and, and as they did in quite significant numbers also uh, in the 1980s. But in this period of growth, we had full employment, we had net immigration, so instead of Ireland exporting its own people, we were for the first time in our history uh, becoming a country and became a country, and still our country, which has now absorbed a considerable uh, amount of, of, of new people, uh, particularly from Eastern Europe and particularly after 2004 uh, when the European borders opened up and when Ireland itself opened its borders to all the new member states who became members of the European Union uh, on the 1st of May 2004. So this is a big change in the topography of Ireland, in the landscape of Ireland, in, every, in, in the way, in the demography of Ireland. The fact that we, have, we went from a homogenous country, which was 100% Irish, 100% almost, or slightly less than 100% Catholic, uh, to a country which now comprises many different nationalities and indeed many different religions and with all the challenges that go along with that. But it was, our, our growth was so, um, so substantial um, that uh, bring in people uh, growing our population and bringing in a workforce, particularly from Eastern Europe, particularly from Poland, uh, you know, became, um, became a natural for us. Um, obviously, when the, when, the, when the boom ended and when the, after the Lehman Brothers collapse, collapse Ireland felt uh, the full force of it. We suffered a, a property a boom, uh, collapsed, the bubble collapsed in 2008, and we went into a very, very dramatic and frightening uh, free fall. Uh, you know, I cannot describe to you just how uh, frightening that was, obviously for people immediately affected who lost their jobs, but for others who risked and feared that they would lose their jobs as well. And for a national economy, 
uh, which, the figures for which were cascading at a dramatic rate going from 2008 to 2010. If I tell you that in general terms, the revenue for a small country as, as is Ireland in any one year leading up to 2007 would have been in the region of 48 to 50 billion um, euros per year. That would be the tax take uh, in those years, in those boom years. Um, and in the space of one year, we went down from 48 to 32, just like that. You can understand the, 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 the crisis that we had in our hands. And particularly also at that time when uh, it was impossible to know where the floor was. So there was a cascade. If you knew it was going to stop at 32, well, you, might, you wouldn't be happy, but at least you know, you know that you stop at 32 and you build from 32 upwards. Uh, but we didn't know where the floor was, but eventually the floor has been established. Um, uh, it's not great, obviously. It remains in around 32. Revenues at the moment are around 32 billion, dollars, 32 billion euros a year. Um, it's, um, it, we have the benefit today of having stabilized as a country, uh, but in achieving that period of uh, point of stability, uh, which is now there and where our country is growing again. This year, or last year, we grew by 1.4% uh, GDP. Uh, not spectacular, but it's certainly better than 2009 when we lost 8% of our economy in one year alone. In 2010, we lost 2% of our economy, all very dramatic. This year, uh, sorry, last year, 2011, we grew by 1.4%. This year, we're going to grow by about 1%. Again, better than the alternative, but really not good enough. Uh, we need to do an awful lot better than that to regain employment and to get back into the fours, fives, sixes, and sevens, which will really see our economy growing again substantially. Tragically and unfortunately, you know, um, we couldn't uh, find our way out of this crisis on our own. Um, um, you know, coming into 2010, it, it very quickly became apparent uh, that we were losing our capacity to borrow money, and every country borrows money. And in all the boom years, we were a triple A country in terms of borrowing rates, but coming into 2010, uh, with the collapse of the banks, with the collapse of the property market, uh, we were in no longer in a position to borrow on the external market um, at rates that were, uh, you know, that were sustainable. Uh, so um, we had to get help. And politically, this was a very difficult thing for a country to do. You see today uh, how difficult it is for Spain, you know, to get it to get to a point where they they ask for help. Uh, in our case, um, we really didn't have any choice. Um, if we wanted to borrow money, uh, we couldn't do so. Uh, so the Troika, the European Central Bank, the European Commission, and, um, and um, the IMF had to be invited in, had to step in uh, to accommodate us in a bailout program which would allow us to continue to borrow money uh, at reasonable rates. But of course, subject to conditions. Terms and conditions most certainly uh, did apply and most certainly do apply. Uh, so we're at the moment in the middle of a bailout program. In fact, we're we're, we're more than halfway through the bailout program and we're more than two thirds of the way through the measures uh, that we've been obliged to take. And this is a very, very difficult thing for a sovereign country uh, to do and to accept, uh, you know, to have um, external bodies uh, come in and really uh, dictate the circumstances under which they are going to facilitate you uh, with, 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 with money. But we had to do it, we had no choice. And, um, but the good news is that we're, we're, we're halfway through the program and we're two thirds of the way through the measures. And the even better news is that on all the, the metrics and all the measurements that go along with this program, and you are measured every three months, they come in and they check out that you, you're doing what you said you'd do and that you're reaching your targets. Uh, we have achieved uh, you know, absolutely full points on, on the basis of seven different reviews over the last seven different periods. So this is something that obviously we'd rather not be in, but it's something we are in. And most importantly, it's also something that once we're in, we honor our commitments. Ireland is honoring its commitments no matter how painful they are. We are paying our way, we are paying our debt, and as I say, there are aspects of all of that that we'd like to kind of reconfigure. Uh, but the commitment, uh, there's nobody running away from the obligation, our international obligations, our international our obligations to, 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 to these institutions. So this is something that if the United States had done what we have done over the last three years, this year the United States would be enjoying a budget surplus of $1.5 trillion. That'll give you some idea of the adjustment that we've had to make in our economy to bring it into line and to bring our deficit ultimately by 2015 down to 3%. This year we're at 8.6% deficit, uh, which still seems like an, a lot of money and a lot, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of ground to make up. But we are committed and we're confident that we will be down to 3% deficit, which is the European commitment uh, by 2015. 2015. Obviously, this is painful. This is painful apart from the politics of it, apart from getting your head around having external advisors or whatever institutions in any event 
uh, you know, guide you and advise you as to what needs to be done. It's also um, difficult, uh, you know, for people to, um, you know, to obviously, the, the consequences have been very, very difficult for people. So unemployment has gone up, uh, having, as I say, reached full employment uh, uh, as recently as 2006, 2007 at 4%. This year we're somewhere between 14 and 15 percent, which is a very, very big challenge for our country. Um, we have seen a, a, a renewal of emigration, so younger Irish people in particular are, are emigrating again, not so much to the United States, you know, uh, but most particularly to places like uh, Australia, uh, Canada, and obviously the UK remains a, a traditional source of, of immigration for Irish people. So that's a kind of a, a return to the days of emigration which we thought we had left behind. Um, uh, uh, but, but people obviously are a little bit more mobile maybe than they were previously. The younger generation are a little bit more, they're certainly well equipped because we've produced a generation of Irish younger people who are among the best um, educated Irish people ever uh, and among the best, the best most educated in their the cohort of, uh, among their international peers. Unfortunately, we've invested in all these young people, but at least in the short term, because we like to believe that they will come back eventually when we finally uh, get, uh, get, see recovery. Um, unfortunately, in the short term, uh, many of them have chosen uh, to, li to leave the country and to take up opportunities elsewhere. So these are all huge uh, uh, challenges for us. And when we were in the, si the eye of the storm, if I'd been speaking here uh, two years ago, the story in the international media was all about our, it was originally about Greece, and we'll come to Greece maybe in a minute, but then it was about, about Ireland. And you know, we, we were the center of attention that we thought we would never be. And uh, we were the center of attention that we thought we'd never you know, certainly that we never wish to have. It's all fine having people focus in your country, but when the focus on your country was in circumstances like I've just described, uh, this wasn't a very pleasant situation uh, uh, to, to be in. Um, but in any event, um, you know, as we have gone through this bailout program, it has emerged uh, that we were not completely alone, uh, that we weren't uh, so exceptionally um, uh, unfortunate that there weren't others that were, you know, uh, about to experience the same trauma. So we had Greece to begin with, then you had Ireland, then you had Portugal, and lo and behold, today uh, the story goes on, and we have Spain, and, and who, who knows uh, who, um, who else will need uh, some adjustments uh, as we go forward. So this is a huge challenge, was a huge challenge for Ireland, uh, and is a huge challenge for Europe, uh, because again, I mean, uh, sometimes the Europeans can lament the fact uh, that they get paid very little attention in the United States, that people don't understand Europe, they don't get Europe, and lo and behold, in more recent times, Europe has become the center of attention again in ways that they'd rather were not the case. It's about how Europe is uh, you know, failing to step up to the plate, how every time they announce an initiative, uh, the initiative comes up short, and, the, and a general sense that Europe just simply cannot get its act together. And more particularly, that Europe is actually dragging down everybody else, whether that's true or whether it's untrue. Uh, and there tends to be a bit of a narrative around, certainly in the United States, and certainly in the United States politics, uh, that were it not for the, tra the, the, the drama and the crisis in Europe, that the, the world economy generally would be better off, and that, that, that America in particular would be doing a lot better. Now, there may be some element of truth in that, but it's also a little bit disingenuous, and it really obscures the fact that there are issues also to be resolved here and elsewhere as well. But in any event, we, um, Europe obviously uh, is the center of attention. Um, you know, there is a sense here that the, what's going on in Europe is of existential uh, dimensions. And, and you know, not only do people talk about like, the euro failing, but they talk about uh, the, the Europe as a, or the EU uh, uh, failing as an entity. Uh, for those of you who know Europe and those of you who have been there, uh, and those of you who study European politics, you know, um, um, I think you probably appreciate my view, which is that it is inconceivable. It is absolutely inconceivable uh, that either the Europe as, as an entity, the entity of the 27 uh, member states, or indeed the euro area um, uh, w could, could be allowed to fail or will fail. So my confident belief is that however we manage it, and however it's done, uh, it not only will the European project survive because it must survive, but within that the European currency will survive because it must survive too. Um, you know, the, the, the obviously getting to a point where that becomes an actual reality and that we know it's an absolute fact, obviously, we're, it, that's still a work in progress. And I say people are frustrated because they feel, you know, the Europeans are slow to step up to the plate. They feel that sometimes Europe, you know, um, you know they announce uh, initiatives only to see them kind of fail away or fade away. Um, but sometimes it's, it, it's important to realize that European politics also has its complexities. You know, no matter, even though we have a financial crisis, it doesn't mean to say uh, that, you know, you can therefore, you can therefore or thereby 
you know, just obscure the fact that Europe is a, a complex political environment, as is the United States. So you see how hard it is to do business in the US Congress? Try multiplying that by 27 times in the case of Europe, uh, or try multiplying that in the case of 17 times in the case of the Euro. And you, you realize that the steps that Europe have taken so far over the last three years you know, shouldn't be discounted as, meaning, as, as not having um, delivered some results. But clearly, more needs to be done. There's no denial of the fact that um, the project is still incomplete. The, the, um, the, the, um, the euro, the creation of the euro currency to begin with, I think people are prepared to recognize publicly now and do recognize publicly that it had inherent flaws in it. Uh, so we must retrofit uh, some of the solutions back into it, which will ensure that it is you know, sustainable into the future. Um, uh, you know, and just yesterday, for example, the European Central Bank uh, was able to step forward in relation to a new bond buying uh, measure or commitment which would be of, of which Ireland would be an immediate beneficiary as a country that is in the process of exiting uh, from the bailout program. Uh, you know, it is important to recognize the fact that I say all of these entities, whether it's the ECB, whether it's German politics, whether it's the fact that we may, not, we may now have an election in France and there, after that we have an election in Greece and we may have an election in Ireland. All of these things are very, very complex and while you, know, you might, and people might wish uh, to see uh, clearer and quicker solutions uh, you know, it, it is a little bit more complex than that, but I do believe uh, that we have made a progress. Um, I do believe that the steps that we're now kind of embarked on uh, leading into the European Council meeting, which will take place in October following the one in, in, in June, uh, you know, will begin to give stability. And even if you look at the currency markets today or indeed the, um, the stock markets today and yesterday, you will see that perhaps there's, there are signs of um, emerging belief, uh, you know, that, that Europe will survive this challenge. Um, for Ireland, we don't wish ill on any other country, but it is a, a, a fact uh, that the more a bigger country is affected, or affected uh, by this crisis, by which I mean in particular for the moment uh, a country like Spain, um, and the more it asserts its right to be treated in a particular way, uh, different to Ireland and Greece and Portugal, um, the, the better that is in some ways for us, because whatever deal is ultimately done for Spain or some of the bigger countries, um, you know, Ireland would be the beneficiary of that as well. It's one thing for a small country like Ireland you know, to be part of the bailout program and to have to accept the measures involved in it. But obviously, as you get into bigger countries, uh, sometimes the disposition is a little bit different, uh, but we can all, as smaller countries, uh, derive some benefit from that. Uh, one of the things we most definitely expect and, um, to derive benefit from is, is this immediate um, commitment by the European Union to separate uh, you know, bank debt from sovereign debt. We have had the catastrophic um, uh, situation where all of the banking debt which we have taken upon ourselves, um, and of course this is a huge political issue as to whether, how in the name of heavens did something that was bank debt, private debt, all of a sudden become my debt, my personal debt, or our country's debt. People say, how, how, how did all that happen? Well, that's the way it, it did happen, and it wasn't unique uh, to Ireland. But all of that debt became part of our sovereign debt affecting obviously our ratings, affecting everything else. But there is now a commitment arising out of the last European Council uh, to separate out and to uh, allow uh, banking debt to be treated in a different way under the ESM, to be treated in a different way uh, to, um, and not to fall on to um, uh, uh, sovereign debt automatically. So that will subtract a certain amount of our debt and make it, make it, make it more sustainable and make it obviously the figures more, more, more manageable. So, so we look forward to those emerging things. The more European policy emerges on this front, the greater the likelihood is that as it emerges and as the changes are made, they will, they will, they will directly benefit um, Ireland in particular. I say we're, uh, we tend to be, in European terms, somewhat of a poster boy uh, as a country which is you know, stepping forward, meeting the challenges, fulfilling the goals, and um, obviously we don't object to that categorization, uh, but, but obviously if there's a better deal to be had within the deal, uh, particularly in relation, relation to, to debt, and to bank debt, obviously we would wish to avail of that. So it's, um, it's, it's obviously a huge um, um, challenge uh, for us. We look forward very much to our presidency of the European Union, which is in the first uh, six months of, of next year, uh, and where we will be, uh, have the management of the Union you know, in the post-Lisbon environment, obviously, and, and um, given our opportunity to uh, obviously play our role in Europe and make our contribution as Euro to Europe as well, because we are you know, committed Europeans, we're committed to the transatlantic alliance, uh, relationship as well, uh, we're committed and um, uh, unique, uh, uh, have a unique friendship with the United States, 
uh, but but the, uh, our relationship with Europe is obviously in terms of trade, in terms of where our economy is, and in terms of where our future is, it's, it's indispensable and it's critical to us. So we want Europe to succeed and we will certainly make our, play our part uh, in assuring that. And if I could just uh, say to you, not every country has, uh, has, has asked its people from time to time to check and see whether they are true believers in the European project or whatever the project was from time to, was from time. To time. Uh, and in the face of all of this crisis and all of a kind of a perceived sense that you know, we've been hard done by Europe and were it not for you know, the ECB or Angela Merkel or whatever else, you know, we'd be a lot, you know, and we're really being, we're really being given a tough time. Uh, the Irish people nonetheless were asked to make a decision in relation to the um, European stability mechanism. I think it was only as recently as last, um, last May. You say that's a, uh, most people, when, when the government announced that we had no choice but to have a referendum, most people said, you haven't a hope. You haven't a hope of convincing people in the face of all of this uh, downturn, in the face of all of this anger, anger uh, that, that people uh, were, were experiencing and were expressing. You hadn't a hope of, of convincing people that their future needed to be in Europe. But lo and behold, um, uh, and this wasn't, of course, the first time that we've asked people to give a Give a, uh, to, to express their views in a referendum on Europe, I think it's about the fifth or sixth time. No other country in Europe has had a, a, a you know, kind of successive validations of, our, of their membership with the European Union in the same way as we have. But would we, you know, but asking the people in the midst of this crisis, you know, whether they could sustain, um, continue to subscribe to this was, was a rather challenging business. But ultimately, you know, people obviously decided that the answer was yes, we're staying with Europe by whatever the figure was, 66%. We're staying with Europe, our future is in Europe, and that, um, and that um, we're going to be part of the European stability mechanism, and that we're going to be a, the, the beneficiaries of the European stability mechanism uh, you know, in years to come. And it's very, very important you know, to ensure that that is the case, because you know, uh, I say Europe is very much part of our, our, of our, of our, of our economy, of our future, uh, and of of of, um, of of our politics as well. So, just let me just uh, digress a little bit, and just to say to you that, you know, when when people talk about Ireland um, in more recent times, and when you see coverage of Ireland, you know, obviously it addresses the question of the crisis, as I say, which is primarily a banking crisis, which is primarily a property crisis, which feed, uh, from which the banking crisis derived. But you wouldn't want to get the impression that therefore Ireland has come to a full stop. Uh, there is a tendency just to concentrate uh, on the fact that we have all of these problems and we do have these problems. But you need to know also that side by side with this, um, the economy is actually you know, doing reasonably well. I say we're growing again. Um, uh, we have, um, we have uh, you know, our exports are up. And when people talk about the fact that they will grow their way out of their, the, the crisis by exports, uh, we don't have any choice. It's the only way we can get our way out of this crisis. Our exports grew last year by 4%. Uh, they're doing very, very well. We, they, they obviously would like to do a little bit better. There would be a concern that as we're swinging out of this crisis that other eco countries may be uh, emerging into it. That would be a big problem because we really do everybody, need everybody to grow. We export 100% of, of what we produce. 100% of our GDP is exported. So we export or we die. Uh, but the good news is that we are exporting and that there is a functioning side to the economy. There's a real economy there. Unlike perhaps, and I don't want to necessarily categorize Greece in this case, but I mean, people do refer to Greece as having a very different economy in Ireland. Ireland most definitely is not Greece, no more than Ireland is Portugal. We have an economy which, is, which has a, a huge manufacturing side. People might be surprised a little bit to know that you know, our biggest industries are pharma, ICT, and uh, financial services, and that you know, we are going to grow our way out of this um, uh, crisis uh, by way of exports primarily. Our exchequer revenues, I mean, the money coming into this, uh, the, the government, as I say, have stabilized. And, uh, you know, we believe that, that, that uh, with a fair wind, um, and with other countries, you know, uh, you're growing as well, that we can certainly work our way out through this, uh, this crisis. It's a crisis, obviously, we never expected. It's a crisis, clearly, we, we could never have planned for. Uh, but uh, it's been a very, very sobering experience, and one which, obviously, you know, having gone through it, uh, the mistakes that were made, are obviously mistakes that will never be revisited again. Um, we obviously, having asserted just how important the relationship is with the European Union, and it is preeminent and, and important, you know, you need to know also, of course, that our relationship with the United States uh, is, is the United States is our biggest single export market. Um, we continue to attract huge American FDI into Ireland, foreign direct investment into Ireland. And in fact, we in Ireland have FDI from the United States 
greater than American FDI into the BRIC countries combined. So Brazil, Russia, India, and China combined. The investment by the United States in those countries is still not as high as uh, the US investment into Ireland. So this has been sustained throughout the period. Many of the FDI countries that came to Ireland over the decades, we have retained them. Very, very few of them have left during the, the crisis period, and most of them continue to do uh, very well. So at the moment, there are about 500 US uh, multinational companies operating in Ireland, all quite successfully, all doing very well, all involved in export, all primarily involved in ICT, pharma, um, uh, financial services and that type of thing. But there is another side to that as well, and that is to the extent that um, the US invests in Ireland, you need to know that Ireland also invests in the United States. And Ireland is about the 13th largest investor in the United States economy. So sometimes when you hear this narrative from Charlotte about shipping jobs overseas and all of that kind of thing, you need to understand that that's part, as we would assert, of the modern reality. But you need to also understand that there is, this is a two-way street. So our relationship is such that Ireland, in its own small way, generates something like 85,000 jobs in the United States. The United States generates about 100,000 jobs in Ireland. So it's two-way, it's mutually beneficial, and obviously we appreciate what we, what we get. Obviously, for, you know, that number of people for Ireland is, a, is clearly a lot, a lot better proportionately than 85,000 here. But nonetheless, it's significant um, uh, and, and obviously very important. But you know, in terms of the scale of it, eight out of the top um, 10 global ICT corporations are in Ireland. Nine out of the top 10 pharmaceutical corporations are in Ireland. 17 out of the top 25 global medical device corporations are in Ireland. And 50% of the world's leading financial services firms are all in Ireland. They're in Ireland for a reason. They're in Ireland because they believe in Ireland's future. They're in Ireland because Ireland is part of the European enterprise, and indeed Ireland is part of the Euro as well, despite the current uncertainties. They're in Ireland because we offer them an educated workforce. They're in Ireland because we speak a reasonably good form of English. They're in Ireland also because we have a tax rate of 12.5%, which is, which is obviously very, very competitive, and obviously a tax rate which, despite the pressures from some of our European partners, uh, we are determined to maintain. So I'm going to just uh, stop there, if, if I may, and just um, uh, maybe get, get a bit of question and answer going and to see whether we could just have a bit of a conversation around some of these issues. Uh, but uh, we're just very um, proud of our relationship with Europe. We're very proud of our relationship with the United States. We deeply, deeply care for our reputation. Um, you know, when, this, uh, when Ireland entered the crisis in 2008, um, we suffered enormous reputation, or we, we felt we had suffered enormous reputational damage. And maybe we were being a bit sensitive, but we, we, we really did feel that, gosh, we'll never get out from this reputational blow. How could a country you know, that was doing so well have ended up in such a dramatically adverse situation? I was delighted to see today that there's an institution out there called the World Reputational Institution. I didn't know it exists, but I'm glad it does. Because if, you, if Canada is the country in the world which has the highest reputation internationally, number one is Canada, you know, Ireland is number 12. We'll take that for the time being until we get back to being number one. Thank you very much, Lee. Yeah, thank you very much for a very informative, stimulating lecture.